Hello and welcome to a virtual tour at the USF Contemporary Art Museum of the current exhibition still here, the Griffith J. Davis Photographs and Archive in Context. I'm Margaret Miller, uh, professor and director of the Contemporary Art Museum. And the museum functions with a faculty advisory council, a very robust uh, faculty advisory council, almost 45 members. Uh, the professor and chair of anthropology, Dr. Antoinette Jackson, introduced us to Dorothy Davis, president of the archive that houses the work in ephemera related to the career of her father, Griffith J. Davis. From this introduction, Dorothy Davis, along with Noel Smith, deputy director and curator of Latin American and Caribbean art, and Christian Viveros Fonet, the Contemporary Art Museum's curator at large, collaborated to organize Still Here, the Griffith J. Davis Photographs and Archive in Context. In the exhibition, images and ephemera from the Griffith Davis Archive are presented alongside modern and contemporary artworks by important Black artists. The exhibition offers a view of Black visual culture and history from the 1940s to the present. Artworks were selected to reflect various themes that will you learn about from the curators as they take you on a virtual tour. So the plan for today is Noel Smith and Christian Viveros Plane will walk us through some of the important photos and ephemera in the exhibition, using them to further introduce um, us to several of the most important works in the exhibition. They will also introduce some of the, uh, uh, the works that are on loan from the Cornell Museum at Rollins College and the Ringling Museum in Sarasota. Uh, these works serve to contextualize the photographs of Griffith Davis. We are still affected by the COVID, COVID uh, pandemic. And so this exhibition is presented both virtually and physically. For the first time, we have a full 3D virtual tour of the exhibition, plus material from a brochure <clears throat> and more information about the participating artists. In the chat box, you can find the link to the virtual tour, but you can all, always Google the University of South Florida Contemporary Art Museum and connect with current exhibitions. Uh, with the help of Dr. Antoinette Jackson, the museum was awarded an internal grant from sponsored research in a category of funding titled Understanding and Addressing Blackness and Anti-Black Racism in Our Local, National, and International Communities. The exhibition has been supported by some of the most wonderful donors in this community, Susanna and Jan Weymouth, Morton Sarah Richter, uh, the Stanton Store Embrace the Arts Foundation was a major sponsor, and we also received fund, fund, funding from the Florida Department of State Division of Cultural Affairs. So if you're watching us on Zoom, write your questions if you have some in the Q&A, and if you're live streaming on Facebook, please leave a comment with your question. So now it's my pleasure to introduce to you Noelle Smith. Noelle? Thank you, Margaret. Thank you so much. I'm so thrilled to be here talking about um, Riff Davis. Um, I'm going to start with a brief bio, and then Christian and I will go into the muse into the exhibition. So Griffith Jerome Davis was born in 1923 on the campus of Morehouse, Morehouse College in Atlanta, and this association shaped his entire life. He was introduced to photography as a high school student at Atlanta University Laboratory High School. And photography became his lifelong passion and primary means of expression. After serving in the Buffalo, excuse me, wait a minute, I lost my, when that came on. Okay, great. I'm sorry about that. Um, after serving in the 92nd Infantry Division or the Buffalo Soldiers in Europe in World War II, he returned to Atlanta and resumed his college career at Morehouse. And at that time, he began to freelance for various publications, including the Atlanta Daily World, Time Magazine, and Ebony. He graduated from Columbia School of Journalism 
and worked from 1949 to 1952 for Black Star, a New York photo agency, and traveled extensively photographing and writing in Africa, Europe, in the United States, and his work was published worldwide. In the early 1950s, Davis joined the US Foreign Service and was a pioneer in Truman's Point Four program for foreign aid, a forerunner of USAID. He and his family served in Liberia, Tunisia, and Nigeria before returning to Washington to direct information and education and communications branch of the Office of Population at USAID headquarters. Griffith Davis retired from the government in 1985 and passed away in 1993. He left behind over 55,000 photographs, ephemera, and texts, forming the Jif Griffith J. Davis Photographs and Archives. And you can see behind me that this um, exhibition uh, was titled um, after a poem by Langston Hughes. So right now I'd like to introduce Christian Viveros Fane, who along with Dorothy uh, Davis was co-curator of the exhibition. Hi, Christian. Hey, how you doing, Noel? Uh, hi everybody, thanks for being with us. So uh, let me just sort of explain the structure of the exhibition as it were. Maybe while we do that, Mark, maybe you can, um, cue that 3D tour for a second. Um, we won't uh, look at individual images with it necessarily. I think we're gonna run through um, uh, a roll of images later, but just, just to get you guys um, uh, accustomed to the idea of, of the 3D tour, which has really turned out to be a fantastic contribution um, to the show. Uh, this show is really a show in at least two parts. Um, it, it sort of focuses in on actual legislators, as it were, uh, of the world, folks who um, are judges and uh, politicians um, and presidents of countries um, and, and folks who essentially sort of wield political power. Uh, and, and on the other hand, uh, there is a, a whole set of images that Griff Davis took um, that were all about what Percy Bysshe Shelley, the, romantic, the English romantic poet, described as the unacknowledged legislators of the world. That's sort of how we made that division. It, it, and those folks are, as, as we'll see in the images that we run through, um, artists, major uh, uh, artists of the 1940s, 50s, and 60s, Black artists specifically. Um, it, it, there, is, there is a way in which Griffith J. Davis was really genuinely Johnny on the spot or more than that for black culture, both in terms of its politics and also in terms of its arts. And what we get to show in this show, in this exhibition is, is, a, 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 is precisely sort of evidence, evidence of that. Um, some of the legislators that we'll look at are folks like Martin Luther King and uh, Supreme Court Justice Thurgood Marshall and uh, NAACP Chairman Julian Bond, uh, several presidents and, and prime ministers from Africa, including uh, Kwame Nkrumah um, and William Tubman of Liberia, uh, etc. But but before we get too deep into that, let me just sort of give you an idea of how this show was put together because it's the first show that was actually put together both virtually and physically inside the museum's galleries um, uh, as objects. We, we had a previous um, uh, show that ran through December called The Neighbors, which was a show of um, a slideshow of, of images of, of Americans. Um, uh, but that show was essentially put together. It even installed via uh, remotely as it were. I mean, someone was actually in there setting up slide projectors, but the images were um, sourced and delivered digitally. Um, and unlike this show, um, we didn't necessarily meet in person with the artist. Um, we of course didn't get to meet with uh, Mr. Davis um, since he passed away in 93, but we did meet, I met specifically, with his daughter, Dorothy, who's the executor of the estate on several occasions in New York, which is where I'm talking to you from. 
um, uh, a storage facility. Um, and we looked through uh, on at least three occasions um, the work that you had, as Noel mentioned, we're talking about 55,000 images, right? Um, and objects and ephemera. Um, and, uh, and in looking, in looking at, at, at those, we made the decisions to, to, uh, as, to, as to what to use to represent his Uber in general, right? Um, so that's the result of, of the show. Um, uh, maybe we, maybe Noel, you can talk about one of the, um, how, sh how should I put it? Uh, one of the great agents in Davis's life in, um, in, well, actually getting him to be a photographer um, and then uh, a major influence and a major mentor for him. Um, shall we go ahead and get started with the images then? Yes. Great. So, all right, let me do this again. Every time Mark puts something on the screen, I, I lose my notes. Okay, there we go. Technology is so wonderful. <laughs> so <laughs> we start here with Langston Hughes. Really, the world in many ways started or uh, Griff Davis's world and career started really when he met Langston Hughes as a student. He was Langston Hughes student in a creative writing course at the um, at Atlanta University. So uh, he took this photograph in 1947, as you can see here, it's been used on a couple of um, uh, covers of books. Um, and so Hughes was really very, very deeply entrenched in um, the cultural world, especially the black cultural world. He was a seminal member of the Harlem Renaissance. He knew everyone. Um, and um, Hughes is particularly known for his portrayal of black life in America in novels, short stories, plays, and poetry. And he wanted to tell the story of his people in ways that reflected their culture, um, including love of music, laughter, and language, along with suffering. And I think we see that that poem still here really reflects on that. So Hughes and Davis became lifelong friends. Um, and, um, uh, and he even, um, talked about or wrote about Griff Davis's marriage to Muriel Corin Davis um, as the basis for his simple series, if Simple Takes a Wife. So um, this, this relationship was incredibly important um, to Davis. And I think also very, very important to uh, Langston Hughes. Um, shall we go ahead and see the next image? Another one of the unacknowledged legislators. Um, so poet William Stanley Braithwaite was um, a key figure in the revival of American poetry. Um, he uh, published the anthology of magazine verse from 1913 to 1929, and it showcased the work of emerging poets, both white and black. And he was uh, termed the Boston dictator for his influence. He was apparently, um, you know, very um, adamant. But besides the fact that he was an important person, uh, we included this image in this because it really shows his, uh, Davis's um, mastery of the black and white photographic form, I think. I just love this picture. I love the way uh, he captured the nuances of the light. I love the sharpness of the face, but also so psychologically revealing. I love the way um, the curtain, you could practically feel the curtain and how it um, contrasts with his tweed jacket. Just really a beautiful picture. And um, I just really wanted to talk about, um, because Davis, yes, he covered a lot, but he also was a really good photographer. 
Um, next one. This is you, Christian. Yeah, this is me. And this is another great portrait. And for those of you who don't recognize him, that's jazz legend Duke Ellington, a uh, great composer, band leader, pianist, uh, etc. Talk about folks who knew everybody and their mother. Um, uh, Ellington would qualify as basically the king of, of, of jazz and, you know, at that point of popular music at the time, um, um, everybody and their step-grandmother. Um, he, the, 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 the title, as it were, and some of the, 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 some of the titling that we've, that we've, that we've used in the show actually, um, accords to specific notes that D Davis took some, some of it, um, basically leaning on captions that David, uh, that Davis, um, used, um, when he published these photos, um, or like I said, notes literally on the back of the photographs. Um, uh, some of those exist as such, like this one. Uh, others, we've just sort of ate that style, but this one is called Jazz Artist Duke Ellington Composing at the Piano While Blowing Smoke, which is clearly <laughs> what we're, you know, what we're looking at. But, but the act of composition and the fact that there is this, that Davis achieved this intimacy with uh, Ellington, because after all, he's not on the bandstand. He's not walking in and out, out of the show. He, he's, you know, doing that creative thing that is, um, you know, really so private, right? And so intimate, sort of bespeaks a certain, um, I don't know, confidence or, uh, and also a certain level of entree um, for someone like Griff Davis. Um, I think you're I think you're right, Christian, if I can interject that Please. all three of these that we've shown or the one you're going to also show really show a degree of int intimacy with his subjects um, and familiarity uh, to get that camera in there so close, you know, and um, just absolutely. He, he was clearly accepted you know, in these <laughs> in these environments, which, which are pretty highfalutin environments culturally yeah. speaking, you know. Um, speaking of that, let's go to, to, to the next image, which, which is again, another great portrait. Uh, this is of uh, Hale Espacio Woodruff, um, who's a, a, a great uh, uh, black painter, a great painter period. Um, and it, it really, we were talking with Noel, um, I think yesterday or the day before, and, <laughs> you know, thinking about how um, how likely it is that Woodruff will have the, the survey that he well deserves very soon because because it suddenly it seems very um, necessary, frankly. Um, so this is Woodruff in his, in his shirt sleeves. Um, Woodruff, among other things, be, he's standing in front of a mural that he painted. Um, uh, among other things, Woodruff actually was one of the few American artists that studied with the Mexican muralist. He studied with Diego Rivera. So he's a really interesting link in that way, not only to folks like Thomas Hart Benton and other folks who actually made murals um, in, in, the, uh, in the States in the 1940s and 50s or 1930s, 40s. Um, but but he's, he's sort of a crucial link um, to abstract expressionism because Mexican muralism is also part of that crucial link. Um, and in fact, he shows up in, uh, that is Woodruff, in a recent Whitney exhibition that, that, was all, that was all about reframing abstract expressionism through the influence of Mexican muralism. The uh, mural that he painted is exactly this one, um, which uh, is titled, it, it's one part of the California Centennial Mural, the one he got to do. Yeah, and, it, and it's titled The Negro in California History, Settlement and Development. And it's a panoramic depiction of black history in California from 1527 to 1949. It's commissioned by Golden, the Golden State. I mean, I guess the question is who would commission such a thing in the 50s? Well, here's the answer. Uh, it, it was commissioned by the Golden State Mutual Life Insurance Company, which was the first black owned insurance company established west of the Mississippi. So when I say 
the Griff Davis in many ways is Johnny on the spot in terms of the <laughs> development of black culture during this epoch. You know, this is one of the reasons why he's there with Braithwaite, he's there with it, with, with uh, Ellington and he's there um, uh, at this sort of pivotal moment in, in the development of, uh, of the black visuality. Christian, another interesting detail is that this building, this was the first uh, life, black owned life insurance company west of the Mississippi and was really key, key in helping black businesses establish and thrive. And also that the um, architect of this building, I, I'm sorry, I can't remember his name right now, but he was also the first black member of the Associ American Association of Architects. So this is like, this, this whole mural is like full of firsts, like this whole exhibition is full of firsts. It's so amazing. That's well put, that's well put. Okay, so, um, we wanted to talk a little bit about the importance of publications, black owned, black started publications, um, not only for the career of, um, of Davis, but also the, important for, the importance for culture. Um, so this is C.A. Scott, and he was the publisher of the Atlanta Daily World. And this was the first daily black newspaper in the United States, um, published in Atlanta, of course, and it served as a much needed voice against the Jim Crow laws and lynchings prevalent in the South at the time. Um, this man was very politically oriented, so he did bring in a lot of politics um, into um, the newspaper, and they covered uh, police brutality, lynchings, the Scott Borough cases, um, and really supported black businesses as well. Campaigned against school segregation, the mistreatment of black soldiers in World War II. Um, and in 1944, it became the first black newspaper to have a black journalist cover the White House. So, um, Griff Davis actually began his career as a freelance photojournalist with the Atlanta Daily World um, when he was a student at, in high school and also at Morehouse College, Spelman College, and Atlanta University. So he was an, C.A. Scott was an important man. This photograph is great. It shows him so, um, so forceful, I think. And I love the way that he put the newspaper there right in the first, um, in the first plane. Um, next image, please. Um, John H. Johnson was the founder of Johnson Publishing Company. And here you see Griff Davis on the left uh, with Johnson. Um, but um, Johnson was responsible for Ebony very important magazine um, for American culture in general, but especially for uh, black American culture. Um, and it followed, it was a general interest magazine that followed the format of Life magazine um, and um, was interested in providing a positive image of blacks. Um, by the early 21st century, it has a circulation of 1.7 million. Uh, it was last published in uh, 2017. Johnson, Johnson also went on to create other publications, including Jet Magazine, and also diversified into book publishing, radio pub broadcasting, etc. cetera. So, um, Davis became the first roving editor of Ebony recommended by Hughes. Okay, so, and this is one of the earlier articles in Ebony um, that actually was um, written by Langston Hughes and John C. Alston with photographs by uh, Griff Davis. And uh, actually we have an autographed copy um, at the 
exhibition in our um, in the middle of the gallery. We have some um, vitrines and we have some interesting magazines, and this is one of them. And um, Davis really really enjoyed and reveled in his um, collaboration with, with Hughes during those years. And so he says about this, about how much fun he had just knocking around with Langston Hughes and coming up with things. And he says, like, the, like our joint story on Atlanta and Ebony, we wrote about things that needed to be said about Atlanta that were not being said. So very interesting um article here and the and the sub and the subhead on that article is is you know it's not exactly a a wilting flower uh i i, I wanted to say something quickly about the um uh about the johnson photo the 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 book he's he's hawking promoting is succeeding against all odds which which sort of <laughs> brings to mind that that I don't remember whose quote it is. I think Michelle Obama mentioned it in one of her speeches, but you know, this you have to be twice as good to get half as much. Um, and, and, and in a way that that um, sort of that represents the history of many of these folks who are um, mm -hmm. who, who uh, uh, Dave has pictured. Um, let's skip ahead, Mark, um, to this show. Uh, pardon me, this this uh, photograph. Um, this one was captioned, um, I don't know for whom, fighting for her right to dream. Thurgood Marshall, um, then chief counsel for the NAACP Legal Defense Fund and future U.S. Supreme Court Justice defends Ada Luis Supuel versus Unif University of Oklahoma Law School, Norman, Oklahoma in 1948. So what you're looking at here in this sort of brilliantly composed photograph, I mean, it, it's uh, let let's just go to the formal aspect, as it were, first. You, uh, as as uh, as my my uh, my esteemed co-curator pointed out to me yesterday, the paperwork is the star of this um, uh, image, uh, as well it should be, because it lays out the arguments um, that uh, really bested segregation. Um, this uh, uh, particular uh, uh, court case um, came to be really the most important precursor for Brown versus Board of Education, which uh, for those that don't remember, is um, uh, what gets rid of, helps get rid of um, separate but equal. Um, uh, and, and, and so again, what we're looking at here first is, is, is some, of the, uh, some of the legal arguments, right? Um, what we see immediately behind is a tremendously composed um, Ada Lee, Louis uh, Sip, Sipwell sort of center. Um, and over to the left, Thurgood Marshall, who clearly is not the Supreme Court Justice yet, right? Um, uh, he, he joined the Supreme Court in 1967. But for me, he, he is clearly the most self-possessed, um, and I'd say probably elegant man in that room. Um, which is which is saying a lot, uh, considering the pressures there were um, uh, in this particular case. Um, I, I think the confidence of both of the main protagonists in this picture um, helped make this really sort of a startling photograph. Um, so again, back to the actual artistry of Davis. Um, I think in all the pictures that we've seen up to now, uh, it, there that sort of artistry is really manifest. Shall we uh, move forward? Unless you want to say something, no. No, no, it's just cool. such a great picture. It I just really is. It. So this picture, which we have used for kind of our standard bearer for the exhibition, um, uh, Griff Davis reviews the script for Liberia's first promotional film, Pepper Bird Lane, with its narrator, emerging actor Sidney Poitier and Monrovia, Li Liberia, 1952. This is where things took a very interesting turn for Griff Davis in his life. Up until this point, he was a roving photographer uh, for Ebony or for Black Star. He was working in Africa while he was in Liberia. He got to know President Tubman. And um, 
he really uh, learned to appreciate Griff Davis's abilities as a communicator um, and as a diplomat. And so he hired uh, Griff Davis to do um, this promotional film, Pepper Birdland, which actually we have at the exhibition. Um, we have a copy of that, thanks to Dorothy Davis. And um, so, and, and then they hired Sidney Poitier who required $75 and credits. Um, and so I, I love this image. I love the, the little guy in the booth um, back there. <laughs> it's just such a, a gritty picture in some ways. But like I said, this is when Griff Davis first sort of entered into the idea of being a diplomat. Because while he was in Monrovia working with Tubman, he uh, got to know the uh, US Embassy personnel there and they encouraged him to take the civil service uh, exam and to become a diplomat. And he did. So um, it was really, I think, um, a turning point for Griff Davis um, here. By the way, Pepperbird Land. Um, Pepperbird is a is a bird that apparently has this very um, distinctive call, and so um, very much associated with Liberia as a country. Okay, um, so now this is actually an image again with, um, with Davis and this is President William V. S. Tubman and um, his uh, wife, the first lady. And um, they're basically just having a visit here. So, um, I guess uh, appropriately, Davis's first posting in Africa was Liberia. In fact, I think that he and his wife Muriel had, um, might have married there, at least had part of their honeymoon there, and then they settled there. Um, so uh, Tubman was the 19th president, longest serving president in the country's history, and was known as a political and social reformer. Um, and also was very supportive of African liberation movements, freeing countries from colonialism. While Liberia was the only black state in Africa that was never subjected to colonial rule and is Africa's oldest republic. Interestingly, as it was established on land acquired for free US, US slaves by the American Colonization Society. Um, so in 1924, the territory was named Liberia and um, Liberian independence was proclaimed in 1847. So hugely long history, complicated history of the United States with Liberia. Want to move on to the next one? There you go. Yeah. So this is a portrait of uh, the Ghanaian prime minister, um, Kwame Nkrumah during a visit to uh, Liberia in 1953. Um, uh, Nkrumah uh, at, the, at the time was the, um, the new uh, prime minister, right? Of what had formerly been the Gold Coast. Uh, the Gold Coast was a British colony uh, on the Gulf of Guinea in West Africa from 1821 to its, uh, in, to its independence. Um, it was the first country in Sub-Saharan Africa to throw off uh, the colonial yoke from um, Europe. He was also, interestingly enough, as has happened from um, with many sort of um, post-colonial leaders, um, uh, Ho Chi Minh comes to mind, uh, a graduate of an American university. He happened to actually go to the Link Lincoln University in Lincoln, Pennsylvania. Um, couldn't have gone to a better named uh, university. Um, in any event, he he Kuma is 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 really sort of becomes a standard bearer for um, not just African independence um, and uh, post-colonial uh, thought, 
but also becomes something of a standard bearer for Pan-Africanists the world around. That is folks who, um, who, who, who are descended from the black diaspora. Um, he in fact becomes um, somebody very important for folks like Malcolm X and for the Panthers uh, in the United States. We have, and, and here's you know, an, another piece of, we have a lot of firsts and because we have a lot of firsts, we also have a lot of uh, different connections that are generally not made in the art history that um, in the in the nominal art history in the orthodox art history. Um, what I'm talking about with respect to Nkrumah in our show specifically is that we have an uh, um, one of our loans, one of our contemporary loans, uh, is uh, um, a poster from Emory Douglas, who was the Minister of Information for the Black Panther Party. Um, from the 60s, basically, until the early 80s. Um, and he doesn't mention Nkrumah, but Nkrumah was a guy who, uh, who fed the Panther ideology significantly. It, it, he, his, 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 uh, one of his books, I, think, I believe it was his first book, um, was, I, I think, number two in the uh, Black Panther reading list. Um, uh, so as you can see, there, there, are, there are a lot of connections here that are made um, just in the images that, that, uh, that, that in the selection of images that we made, but also in the, in the career of, uh, of Davis. And then there's this image, which also, <clears throat> not bizarrely, but interestingly taken um, in Africa. Um, this is taken uh, in 1957 during the Independence Day celebrations in, again, nearly sovereign Ghana, that is uh, uh, Nkrumah's Ghana. Um, uh, uh, Davis attended the celebration both as a friend of Nkrumah and also as representative of the United States Information Service. Um, but this photo is really interesting for a number of reasons. Um, the, the first of which is, is that it, it was not published until last year um, when it was published by the Tampa Bay Times. Um, and, it, and it wasn't published until last year by the Tampa Bay Times because contemporaneously it couldn't be published. Um, it couldn't be really reproduced in separate but equal America. For, um, but it was the first meeting between Martin Luther King um, and Richard Nixon ever. Um, and again, uh, Griff Davis on the spot was there to record it. Christian, I, I wanted to um, comment to a little bit about Nkrumah and um, what he wore. And it's very interesting to see on all the photos that uh, are in the exhibition where uh, Nkrumah and his cabinet and every one of the government were wearing African clothing um, as opposed to, very proudly to, um, as opposed to we see some of the other photos um, of uh, Nigeria, et cetera, where it's very Western wear. So, um, it's English. quite lovely to see them all dressed like this. Yeah, as opposed to English uh, dark ju judicial robes, et cetera. Exactly, yeah. yeah. Okay, thank you, Mark. Let's go back to, um, there we go. One of the interesting things that Griff Davis did uh, while he was a diplomat was to use his photography very judiciously. And he used it um, to communicate both with the country he was in, but also with USAID. So he used his photography to advance, and we'll see a little bit a little bit later, um, to advance certain um, to certain um, initiatives, uh, projects, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and uh, I think they spoke um, most convincingly to Washington. So here. They're looking at this gentleman is called Gabriel Mo, and he's actually uh, a rice specialist from Louisiana. Um, and so um, he um, 
He was there in the Gabadon uh, Swamp Rice Project, started in North Central Liberia in the mid 50s. And this was intended to make Liberia self-sufficient in rice. Um, so um, there's a number of other images as well with um, sawmills and um, a waterfall, et cetera. And then we'll see some really interesting ones a little bit later. Uh, next image, please, Mark. Um, so here we have Dwight Eisenhower and President Habib Bourguiba meeting in Tunisia in 1959. Um, so um, this was Eisenhower's official visit. Um, and um, basically um, Eisenhower was following a policy of containment that is containing the Arab world, containing uh, communism, et cetera, et cetera. So Bourguiba was a great ally of the United States um, for many years. And he was architect of Tunisia's independence. Tunisia was a um, French colony. Um, Bourguiba was put in jail and arrested, I think three times. Um, by the French for his independence activities until finally, um, finally in 1957, uh, the French forces left, um, the monarchy was deposed and a secular government was, um, was instituted. So um, when Eisenhower visited Tunisia in 1959, um, the story goes that he asked uh, Bourguiba how the United States could be most helpful. And Bourguiba responded, ask, not, asking not for military aid, but by requesting food, education, and shelter. So he was uh, quite an enlightened, um, an enlightened president. Apparently, um, he gave Eisenhower two gazelles and a brown horse. Um, who knows what Eisenhower did with those things, <laughs> but, uh, but it's a know. lovely gesture. <laughs> yeah, well, I, I don't know if those qualify as emoluments, but, uh, you know, maybe not. Um, uh, Mark, let's skip on to uh, this image and the following two. Now, now um, Noel, what was it uh, that uh, Eisen, um, Bur Burgiv asked for? He asked for... He asked food. for food, education, and shelter. Right. This would be in the education cultural sort of like yes. section of what of, of the ask, mm -hmm. of the give, as it were. Um, so what you're looking at here is a newly arrived mobile cinema van. Um, and it's being inspected at La Goulette Port by Tunisian and US officials. Um, uh, go, let's go to the next image. Uh, What's it for? Well, you know, it, it's because Davis basically thought up, you know, I, I guess in, in, in uh, consultation with his immediate superiors, the idea of basically taking culture that is film in this case to the masses. You can imagine, or you can see rather, not imagine, um, the uh, sheer joy and amazement um, experienced by this multitude of folks in the Tunisian countryside at seeing a movie. Likely, I would be willing to bet their first movie, their first set of moving images, mm -hmm. right? Um, and, and I mean, just sort of think about the potential impact of that. Um, uh, I, you know, it, it, it really, and maybe let's, let's hit the next image, both for um, adults and obviously for children, what this must have meant, what this, the, the world this sort of must have opened up. Um, so, you know, again, one of the really sort of amazing things um, is, is the way um, Davis continues to sort of spool out his cultural concerns. Um, some of them are basically channeled through the lens of the camera and then uh, and then through policy in this instance right this is something he not only chose to do i'd be willing to bet he actually sort of um uh, uh 
innovated and came up with this idea. Anyway, next images. Oh, our next images actually is where we move into the contemporary uh, images that we have um, uh, that that we've decided to that we decided to put in conversation um, with with Davis's black and white images, um, in which we got on 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 loan and which which we were very grateful for from the Cornell Museum at Rollins and the Ringler Museum. Um, do you want to talk on this one, Noel? Sure. Jacob Lawrence was really important artist, uh, rooted in, in um, the uh, Harlem Renaissance. And uh, he memorialized many, many important events in American history through his paintings and prints. Uh, one of his most famous is the Great Migration, which uh, documented the depression era flight of black Americans from the rural South to the North. I was lucky enough to see part of it at the Phillips collection a couple of years ago. It shares it with MoMA, just incredible with the very simple kind of um, format, simple expression, so powerful. So in this print, he is memorializing, commemorating the 150th anniversary of the 1939 revolt on the Amistad, which was basically a story of um, Africans captured in Sierra Leone and carried, uh, taken to the United States. But before they got to the United States, they revolted and demanded their freedom. And this became, um, a Supreme Court, uh, um, US Supreme Court uh, case, which ultimately was decided in favor of the African um, men. And most of them were returned uh, to Africa. Some of them I think didn't have as happy an ending, but um, in any case, so this is a silk screen Apparently it, was, it took really a long time to make, very complicated. Um, you can see the slashing marks, um, which both uh, refer to uh, the battle on board. You can see the, the, um, the uh, water down there and also in one sense to a kind of celebration. Um, and uh, I do believe they used 47 different screens um, to make this print. Um, it has the connection to Hale Woodruff, who we looked at earlier, because Hale Woodruff, um, a few years earlier, I think in the late 40s, did a series of um, murals at the Savory Library in Alabama, um, commemorating the the same the revolt on the Amistad so absolutely so again we get you know one of these um, they're not quite cross references um, uh, but we get these artists talking to each other through Davis's photographs but also through a history of black representation that Davis is essentially getting down um, let's let's go to the next image. Um, but we have a number of, of instances of that happening um, in the show. So, and, and so when you when you visit the show, whether you do it in person or whether you do it through the three D um, uh, tour, um, think about that. Try and make those connections because there are very many of them there. There are too many for us to actually go into uh, today. Um, this this uh, uh, image is by Dina Lawson. Um, and it's called Binky and Tony Forever. It's from 2009. Um, uh, Lawson specializes in black subjects that you know seem like they're in their sort of own situations, um, um, revealing stuff about themselves and um, and their environment. In fact, uh, often they are posed um, as they are in this picture. They're they're these this couple first firstly apparently is not a couple but um uh um but there are two folks who uh lawson decided to picture together got to picture together but and they're also in lawson's actual bedroom 
um, uh, we get a sort of an idealized uh, version of what could be contemporary black love, right? Um, the um, sort of almost Jesus-like figure looking over them uh, is uh, right above the, uh, their heads in that picture. That's um, I, uh, the cover of the Michael Jackson. I believe it's a Michael Jackson. No, yeah. it's not the Thriller album, but it is Michael Jackson. A picture of Michael Jackson. Um, uh, again, she Lawson's got a really um, she's very good at making works that look particularly emblematic of a certain age. The iconic is really the word. Um, and this one wound up as a cover for um, the musician Blood Orange's 2016 album, The Freetown Sound. Let's go to the next one. And this is um, Hank Willis Thomas, one of the number of prints that we have of his in the show, what Thomas is really all about is sort of what you now call culture jamming or even ad busting, right? You take images and you <clears throat> um, you retool them, you you sort of replay them, um, all in the interests of basically sort of mining or undermining of subverting ideas of identity or history that are uh, you know basically sort of uh, the unwritten this the, sometimes not even the subtext but the tax of, of advertising right um or of official photography um thomas does this also in sculpture there's a there's a about a mile and a half from me there's a major hank willis thomas sculpture called unity that is either at the beginning or at the end of the Brooklyn Bridge, depending on what you think is the beginning of the end of that bridge, whether Brooklyn or Manhattan. Um, but but he, what what he's what he's really good at um, is is again sort of pointing out um, ways in which um, objects and images that we think or we're familiar with and we think we've exhausted can actually hide other things. So clearly, in, in this image, he's put the image of a woman um, in with the rest of these presidential figures. Um, not, it's not Trump, um, it's not Hillary either, but it's a woman. Um, uh, but again, in terms of sort of these cross pollinations that we've been talking about, another reason we wanted to include him was because um, his, his mother, uh, Deborah Willis, um, is a is a great scholar of uh, Black American photography, and it just so happens, though in this case the just so happens never just so happens. It's actually part of a significant development um, in the history of uh, of the Black image um, that one of her mentors was Griff Davis. So I'd also like to note that we have. Um, two beautiful self-portraits by the African um, artist Zanali Maholi, um, borrowed from the Ringling, as well as a couple of prints, as you mentioned earlier, from um, Emory Douglas. Um, and those come from the Cornell. So some really beautiful um, contemporary works to complement the Davis. So I think, that's it, huh? Yeah, I think we're I think we're we're good for our end of uh, the tour. Now, if there's any questions, um, we've got a couple. Um, cool. But if anyone who's out there has more, go ahead and put them into the Q and A. One <clears throat> interesting question: Is there anyone like Griffith Davis today? Does this profession even exist anymore? Could there be a Griffith Davis, I guess, is the question. Wow. Well, certainly photojournalism is well and well and alive. Um, you know, I think we see millions of photos every day, but what they're probably asking is there's someone who has that kind of focus and who has that kind of impact. Um, well, you know, I don't know. 
What do you think, Christian? I mean, I, I, I think, <clears throat> I, I think, I think part of the answer is no, because we, what we've described as a series of firsts don't mm -hmm. get to happen again. Um, so, you know, there's, there's, there's no one who's basically going to be up to bat first the way that Davis was. Um, but sure, we've got very important photojournalists out there. Um, we've got very important black uh, photographers out there um, doing sort of amazing work and, uh, and basically sort of hitting their own first pitches, you know, out of the park. Um, uh, I'm, I'm sort of, I, I just saw a Gordon Park show um, this Saturday um and you know i was sort of thinking about him in terms of some first as well um but it, it's you know it's a, it the the i think that i think the answer is 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 that um uh there there is a lot of amazing uh work being done by a, a number of amazing artists um out there uh, Zora J. Murph comes to mind, who was in the Neighbors show, of course. Um, uh, um, but yeah, there's, uh, I totally lost my train of thought, but um, yeah. Well, you know, it also may be that there may be a person out there that we don't know about yet and some movement that we don't know about yet. So, you know, in a certain way, um, Davis was operating a little bit sub rosa. Um, all this was happening um, in the midst of a lot of other things. So that's, I think that's an interesting question that we can't really answer. <laughs> a future archive, right? <laughs> I just think it would be a different archive. You know, it's just, uh, it, things are no longer sub rosa as Noel said, but there's no shortage of great work out there. That's right. part of the answer. And the, maybe the first part of the answer is that, you know, you can't come at things new, n new in the same way that the Davis came at them uh, in the fifties. Well, that kind of gets us there. I had one thought that last uh, Hank Willis Thomas image got me thinking about Griff's photos a little differently. And I, I was feeling like there's kind of a thread of, of feminism running through the archive as well that is maybe not, not fully explored yet, but just between you know, his life of his wife living in Tunisia in the Middle East, you know, as uh, in early colonial periods, it just, there's something going on there that I think is, is worth considering a little bit. Well, I think that the, the archive has a lot to give, um, still a lot. And I know uh, Dorothy has, uh, it's interesting, we did a talk with her a couple of weeks ago and she talked about how completely overwhelmed she was by discovering what her father had done. <laughs> I was like, dad, what did you do? <laughs> um, so, you know, and there's so much left, there's so much more there. So, uh, and that could certainly be because yeah, he really did document a lot of um, wonderful African-American women um, who were first in their fields. That, and he actually sort of, and I, I remember Dorothy saying that, um, you know, her, her mother really sort of refused to be, um, uh, you know, the usual um, diplomatic spouse and, and basically lived a life in, in the way that, you know, they chose to live it. Um, and, you know, that, that was, um, clearly a, a, an unusual uh, thing. Um, yeah, the other thing I, I, I sort of wanted to, to, to point out, um, and, and this is what I was thinking in terms of Gordon Parks, uh, who again is a two gallery show in, in New York, if any of you uh, listening are up here. And, and that is that one of the sort of 
crazy things about Davis's career is that he did so much. Um, and, and in doing so much, sometimes um, the, the folks have a, have, have a difficult time, audiences have a difficult time digesting the essence of what that is, right? Of what that too much is. It, 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 it happens to folks who, you know, who write and sing, <laughs> play in a band and make paintings. And, you know, folks often have a difficult time sort of like um, uh, getting, getting a focus on them. And so hopefully what this show will do along with any number of other shows that I'm sure will um, come on the heels of, of Still Here is look at the work um, with, you know, a, a, a closer focus um, and get a sense of what he really did with photography. Um, what he did diplomatically has its own moment and its own uh, story. But in terms of the photographs, I think it's beyond high time that we actually look just at those. Um, and if we had 20 years hence, maybe he'd be um, uh, where um, some of the photographers that we're talking about, uh, some of the some better known photographers that we're, we've been talking about, uh, Gordon Parks among them would, would be now, right? Well, I think that we have come to the uh, end of the hour and the conversation was really illuminating and brought us into a closer observation of some of the work of uh, Griff Davis and the context that the newer works um, by leading black artists represent. So thank you, Noel, and thank you, Christian, for a very good conversation. And I still have to make my way over to really look at the show in person. I get the privilege of doing that because I'm a member of the faculty and students that are listening. I hope you'll come and make an appointment to see the exhibition. And for others, I hope you will view it virtually. So thank you. Great conversation. Those listening, come back for more as we um, work on uh, a series of really vital exhibitions over the next few years. We hope you'll stay with us. Thank you and goodbye. Bye-bye.